So we found the area between two curves, but what if rather than directly finding that area, we want to play around with um, rotating it. So say I take something and I rotate it, it, what happens when you rotate is it creates this disc. Okay, when you take an area and you spin it around, it's creating this disc. What, what is the base of a disc? And so what's happening is you're creating a rectangle with your curve. And a rectangle with spun around gets a circle oh, with a height that's a width of the rectangle. And so they kind of, they stack up on each other. That's cool. So if you look, see how the rectangle's rotating? Yeah, the rectangle's and as, it, as this rectangle rotates, it's going along the disc. So is height x? So the height, so the radius of the circle is f of x. The radius of the circle is f of x. So notice that the rectangle is only the radius of the, the disc. It's not the, it's not the um, diameter. Yeah. And then dx, dx, that's the width or the height of the disc. All right, and so, so yeah, you can see those as they spin around. And then as you stack more discs, you're gonna get a smoother curve. So the more discs you stack, the smoother your curve becomes. So we're gonna do approach infinity again. All right, and so eventually as you approach infinity, then it becomes a smooth object. All right, so if you did individual discs, you'd have to compute each individual area until like this, when it's only one disc. Is that a very good representation of that shape? But now you cut it into two. Now that cuts off a little bit, cuts off a little bit, cuts off a little bit, and eventually it smooths out. All right? So maybe this is, maybe we're computing the volume of a bowl. Because most bowls aren't a perfect shape. They usually have this, you know, nice, pretty design of a curve. And that curve can be represented by different conic sections. It's being spun around the curve. So, yeah. So we'll be doing that. Um, and then, so we can have different boundaries on it because like if it's a bowl, you wouldn't want the dip bottom to wobble, so you cut off the bottom. So you can cut off the bottom and do that rotation like that too. Uh, one other, one of these videos, well not video, but. You're ready for the show. So when you're, what we're gonna be doing is you're gonna be, basically what you're doing is you're taking that area between the curve and the axis. You're gonna take that area between the curve and the axis and rather <coughs> than just leaving it alone, now we're gonna be doing a rotation. And please tell me this one knows what I want it to do. Okay, this one does not do what I want. That's doing something else. So that, this one isn't actively showing, but basically by rotating around, you're now creating this three-dimensional shape. And since it's three-dimensional, it's volume. Okay, because it's three-dimensional, now we have volume. And so we're actually gonna be spinning, you're actually spinning your, um, we're, we're adding on the z-axis now, because when you spin out this two-dimensional area, now you, you're adding in that third dimension. And so we won't be using the variable Z, but just the action of volume is adding on a third component. All right, so that's what we're gonna be doing notes on today. Where did my PowerPoint go? Why did my PowerPoint go away? My computer's just being fantastic. We're doing volume by the disk method. And so we are going to be 
rotating around the axis. Anytime you revolve a region around a line, it's called a solid of revolution. So if I take this rectangle and I spin it around, I am creating a solid of revolution, a solid shape created by revolving something around the axis. Okay? And so we represent it with a rectangle. The height of the rectangle, we usually use a capital R for radius. Okay, so the function for the height of the rectangle is your radius, and your dx, your change in x, is your width. Okay, so dx is our width. So in an integral, you can have a function in dx, right? So we'll be using integrals to compute this. And so we're spinning around, but since we're spinning around, I don't want to just integrate f of x. If I just integrated f of x, it would just be the area under the curve. What's the area of the shape? Pi r squared. With the radius being f of x. So we're going to get pi f of x squared. And that's what we'll integrate. We will integrate pi f of x squared. Why? Because the shape is a circle. And so we're integrating area. So if you integrate a function, you get area. If you integrate an area, you get volume. So it always goes one power up. So when we were integrating a straight line, we could get area. But now when we integrate area, we'll get volume. And so we're using the area formula for a circle because when you spin around, you get a circle. We will look at other shapes. There are other shapes that you could define. Um, but they won't involve revolving. If, as soon as you do that action of spinning, that action of spinning on a fixed point always creates a cir circular shape. All right. There's nothing above volume, right? What? There's nothing above volume. Um, nothing meaningful of a volume when you're talking about an object. What is like, what is shape depending on what axis you spin around. Okay, so you will not get the same volume if you spin around different axes. With area, your area bounded was the same no matter what. But now as you rotate a shape, depending on if you rotate it horizontally or vertically, it will be different. Yeah. 
learning tool there. <laughs> All right, so now pi, pi is still there. So Isaac had said pi r squared was the area of a circle. We just bring the pi in front because pi is a constant. So the constant doesn't affect the integral. So I get pi, the integral from a to b of rx squared, okay, because our formula for the radius is a changing function. Um, if it's with y, then you have pi ry squared, dy. And so always, ask, so always think, like, how does this come? What is the shape of a disk? What's the base of a disk? A circle. Because why memorize a formula if it's just based on something we know? So these questions just help us realize where does this come from. What is the area of a circle? Do you guys remember what exactly integrals are doing? Area. Area of curve. When it's of a function on its own, yes, it's area under the curve. But in general, area, integrals, like our basic definition of integral was a summation. It was adding pieces together. So it accumulates. Integrals accumulate. And that's why it gets areas when you're adding individual points, eventually it creates an area. Well now if I add a bunch of areas, I'm gonna get volume. So integrals do what? They actually, they do the action of accumulating. And so when we accumulate a bunch of areas, we get the volume. So say I pick a different shape for the base of my volume of my object. For example, even though I wouldn't need to do it, say I wanted to compute the, the volume of this. I could do it with calculus. Yes, we have a simpler formula. But in theory, I could do this with calculus because its base is a square. And so I would just integrate r squared, or psi squared. And so in this case, its side is a fixed value. And so I would be integrating, um, I don't know, like four squared and I'd integrate that fixed value for dx for the distance of the width of this, okay? But we can do that for any object. Any object to find the volume, so the integral of the base shape, the integral of the area of the base shape. So you always ask yourself, what is this, the shape of the base? What's the area of that shape? And then how do I accumulate it using integrals? And so here's a visual of the little, what's happening. We're cutting out these discs, or we're cutting out these rectangles and so that's our radius, and then when we spin it, that's what's gonna create. And so delta x is our dx. And so if we do it with respect to y, now we're getting a different r, r of x, and so that's gonna create a different shape. the region bounded by f of x equals the square root of sine x and the x-axis around the x-axis. Okay, so it's really nice when we're bound by the x-axis and revolve around the x. It means what's happening is there's no gap between our function and the axis, so that's a really good thing. Okay, um, now yes you could look at the picture right now to find the bounds, but if I hadn't put the picture up there, how could we find the boundaries? Well, it's bound by the function in the x-axis. So what's the value at the x-axis? Zero. So I would say square root of sine x equals zero. Try to get sine by itself, so I square both sides. So sine x equals zero. Where is sine zero? And technically it goes on forever, but I'm only looking for one boundary. I'm only looking for whatever the first bound is. All right, unless they give me a different um, domain. But so zero and pi. So now I get the integral from zero to pi, and I wanna do pi r squared. 
So pi r squared, and since it says around the x-axis, that tells me dx. Around the x-axis tells me I have to have dx. So now in here I put square root of sine x. Well, what's the square root of sine x squared? So this becomes pi, the integral from zero to pi of sine x dx. What's the integral of sine x? Negative cosine x from zero to pi. Now you put in your top bound minus your bottom bound. Top boundary minus our bottom boundary. So I get pi negative cosine of, sorry, time. So negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of zero. What's cosine of pi? So I get pi negative negative one. These two negatives become a plus. What's cosine of zero? Well, negative negative one is one plus one is so my volume is 2 pi. And so this is what this shape would look like if you were revolving around. It could almost model the volume of a football. Okay, so it almost model the volume of a football because a football is an irregular shape. And so if this function modeled that football and you rotate it around, now we can actually compute its volume. So we're gonna do one more and then the rest will be for tomorrow. Find the volume of the solid bounded by f of x equals two minus x squared, g of x equals one and y equals one. Um, I should have added a phrase in here about the x-axis. Wait, no, hold on. Never mind, it says it about. Ignore me. Ignore me. Ignore me. All right, 2 minus x squared. Let's sketch a picture of it. Yes, it's a downward parabola. So when I plug in 0, it goes through 2. When I plug in 1, 2 minus 1 squared is 1. 2 minus negative 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4, so 2 minus 4 is negative 2. There's a graph of that kind of badly drawn parabola. And it's bound by this. So we're doing this area, but I'm revolving it about not the y-axis, about y equals one. Well, if y equals one, isn't that the same as g of x equals one? g of x equals one and y equals one are the same thing. So this right here is what I'm revolving around. That's my revolve. I'm gonna revolve around that line. And so that's nice because it's touching. It's touching, okay? Anytime you're touching, it's straightforward, okay? And the line y equals one is a horizontal line. Since it's a horizontal line, it's with respect to Anytime it's a horizontal line, it's with respect to x. And so area, we're always taking, our radius it always relates to the area function. And radius is always the top curve minus the bottom curve. So what's my top curve here? What's the 
curve that it's bounded by. So you always have to do, wait, not squared. So you always have to do the top minus the bottom. You, to find the area, you do the top minus the bottom. And then I'll take that and be, I'll go plug that into our formula. Okay, so we'll be plugging that into our formula. All right, so. Now we need to find our boundaries. Can you see what our boundaries are? What's my boundary? One and negative one. It intersects at one and negative one. Because that's where that's where 2 minus x squared equals 1. Now, can I simplify this top minus the bottom curve? That's 1 minus x squared. 1 minus x squared. So now I need the integral from negative 1 to 1 and pi r squared dx. But what's my radius? My radius was a top curve minus the bottom curve. Now again, I can just do straightforward like this, just top curve minus bottom curve, because there's no gap with what I'm revolving it around. Okay, since I'm revolving it around one, I'm taking away that one and revolving around it, and that's fine. It, there will be a more complicated situation about if a gap is formed. If a gap is formed, we'll have to do some a little extra. All right. So, what's our best approach to doing this? You could do u substitution, but there's no 2x to cancel out. So really, you're just stuck multiplying this out. So that's 1 minus x squared times 1 minus x squared. Remember, we're not allowed to distribute an exponent when there's addition subtraction. So that's 1 minus x squared minus x squared, so minus 2x squared, plus x to the fourth dx. When I integrate 1, it becomes? When I integrate 2x squared, it becomes? So I add 1 to the exponent, and I divide by the new exponent, plus x to the fifth over five from negative one to one. And so now I just gotta plug in my values and simplify. So let's see, I'm gonna kind of come over here. So I have pi one minus well, one cubed is just one, right? So are we okay if I just write that as two thirds? Plus one to the fifth is still one, so that's one fifth. Minus, now I plug in negative one. I need to be a little more careful with that negative one. One, when I plug in negative one, I get negative one cubed. Well, negative one cubed is a, times this negative is a, Positive. Wait, this should be negative one in front because I'm plugging in negative one for x. So negative one plus two thirds, and then I plug negative one to the fifth. A negative to an odd power is always negative. So that's negative one fifth. Now notice they're all opposite the first set, but it's subtraction of it. So when I distribute that negative, all their signs change back. All their signs change back. So now I have one plus one is two. Two thirds, negative two thirds plus negative two thirds is negative four thirds. One fifth plus one fifth is two fifths. Well, what am I going to have to do to add these to, into a single object? Common denominator. Remember when you told fractions would never go away? Fractions are never going away. 
So, all of this should be over 15. So, 2 times 15 is 30. This needs 5 over 5, so that becomes negative 20. This one needs 3 over 3, so that becomes 6. 30 minus 20 plus 6. 16 pi over 15 is my area. Volume. 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 So that is it for the no. Tomorrow we learn washer method. Tomorrow we learn if there's a gap between it and the curve. The common denominator, I wrote the common denominator out front. So I could have just done 30 over 15, 20 over yeah. 15, 6 over 15 like that.